So in this, this uh, presentation we'll look at some code forensics and we'll start off by looking at some com computer architecture to see where our systems are actually going and to identify what type of code that machines understand. Then we'll look specifically at Microsoft.net and the type of code that it produces and we'll look at an example of the obfuscation process where we should find out that .NET and Java are fairly insecure in terms of reverse engineering so we need to use techniques such as obfuscation to overcome that. Then we'll quickly look at some behavioural analysis, some network analysis and then we'll finish off with some practical .NET host based forensics systems. Okay, so what's the focus of this presentation? Well, we'll have a look at uh, some static code analysis. Then we'll look to see uh, the methods that someone might use uh, to be able to regenerate code or reverse engineer from our machine code back into source code. We might also use the same techniques in terms of a code review or debug where we find bugs, we validate and evaluate programs. We might also look at uh, some sort of damage analysis. If we have a piece of malware, how we can actually analyze what damage it's actually done to the system. And then finally, we might use it to be able to identify the basic network or host behavior of an executable program, such as the CPU utilization, memory, the network connections it creates, the communication protocol it uses, and so on. And we might also look at the, the payload analysis of the, for the code execution so that it can actually detect any piece of malware coming through our systems. So why would we use code forensics? Uh, so there are possibly many reasons that we can do this. We can obviously recover code from an original, from an EXE. Uh, we might look at code metrics to be able to evaluate uh, how something actually runs and obviously its basic footprint, what's the memory u utilization, what network connections to use and so on. And we might also analyze our code to be able to see if there is any data leakage or even spyware actually on our, our programs. Again, we might look at some vulnerability analysis. What's the, what's the stress points with inside our program? could look at opt code optimization to understand the bottlenecks by running the executable through some sort of debugger. We might uh, use it for some sort of uh, reverse engineering or someone might use it for that. There could be a legal challenge to analyze a program to see where liability lies for any damage. We might use it for debugging programs for bugs and in terms of damage analysis. So really we split into two main sections when it comes to code. In terms of humans, we understand high level, we mainly understand high level languages because they're fairly easy for us to read and interpret. They're written in a pseudo-English form, in an algorithmic form. They tend to be uh, fairly mathematical in their approach. We can easily represent mathematical techniques and, and logic. So two examples of this are C++ and C sharp. We can see here that it's fairly easy for a human to read these these languages. Unfortunately computers don't understand this type of program directly and all they really understand is machine codes or binary code. So the types of code that they understand are similar in their abstraction to this type of code. So we see here uh, Intel 86 code, ARM code, and intermediate code. This type of code is near the actual machine code that a, a computer would actually understand. We can see that it's still in a form that is readable by a human, but these would be converted into op codes and obviously into, into binary for a computer to actually understand. So we'd call languages here high-level languages, and we call languages here low-level languages. But basically, all 
or high level language becomes some sort of machine code at some time because it needs to run on a processor. So the basic flows that we have is that we can either have a compiled language on this side and with a compiled language we have uh, languages such as C++, Fortran, VB.NET, Delphi, C Sharp and so on. We go through a compiler which checks the syntax and does other validation tests. Some will even check for runtime errors. From here we get our object code and then from our object code we uh, communicate with a linker which brings together lots of different object code files and also with static libraries that might have things like the code to write to the screen or read from the keyboard and so on. This object code can exist as a program on its own as it doesn't have the fundamental building blocks that come from other OBGs and other bits of code so the link is thus required to create an executable code. So the output, if everything is okay, is uh, an executable or runnable code, which is the machine code to be able to run on the computer. This, when it's run, creates normally a process. And the process itself doesn't have to all have all the code that's required to run the program. At one time we compiled very large programs and ended up with very large EXEs. These days we can port the executable alongside DLLs or with standard DLLs so that when they run they call the DLLs as required. So if a, if a program wants to use the USB adapter it might call the code that's required from a DLL which holds the USB code once it executes it and it doesn't need it anymore, then it can put it back and it doesn't actually need to keep running the, the DLL. So we have a whole lot of other DLLs that we might use in our in our process. So these this type of code is fairly fast. It's optimized for the architecture that we're running the system on. And it's also fairly good at checking for errors either before runtime, such as syntax errors, or within runtime. Especially languages such as VB.NET and C Sharp are very good at spotting errors that could occur while the program is actually running and try to catch them. So the other type of uh, code that we get is, a is the interpreted code. So this includes uh, Languages such as BASIC, LISP, Python, Ruby, ASP, PHP, JavaScript, Tickle, and and so on. These tend not to be com these are not compiled, so the the system must interpret the code as as it's actually running. So, for example, JavaScript, a web browser, reads the JavaScript and actually runs the code with inside the browser on the client. This is then, the interpreter then converts it into runnable code. This type of language, the interpreter, is much, much slower than compiled as it's non-optimized and must be interpreted. It can also be error prone, that it's fairly easy for an error to happen and then at runtime for the error to go unchecked. So this type of code is often preferable. It's easier to create more compatible code here because we actually know the system that we're writing for. Over here we can have problems with the uh, version of the code. And this often happened with JavaScript that uh, it mattered what browser was actually running the JavaScript as JavaScript was in the past continually changing. Okay, so let's look at the architecture that we design our code for. So this is highly important as it provides the key as to what type of code that we see at machine level. The three main types of architectures used at the present time are the standard Intel x86 code, the 32-bit architecture, 
we now seeing 64-bit code, especially in Windows 7 64-bit. But increasingly, we see this ARM architecture, which is used in mobile phone type technology. A low powered uh, type processor and is now becoming extremely uh, popular. So the three main types, main classifications that we have. So we have the standard x86 architecture which has grown up through the 8086, 8088, 8386, 8486 onto Pentium and now on to the Intel i-series. Along with this uh, we get different ranges of processors such as the Intel Atom which is often used in netbooks because of its low power and fairly good uh, uh, fairly good CPU uh, throughput. We also get fairly general processors that are fairly powerful and are used in notebooks. So with x86 we have a 32-bit data bus and it's been used in DOS, Windows, Linux, BSD, Solaris and Mac OS. The basic architecture of a, an Apple Mac or a, or a MacBook uh, is around the x86 architecture. The newer type processors are the 64-bit ones and though these support a 64-bit data bus and that includes the i7, Intel Xeon and so on and that's supported on Windows 7, Linux and Mac OS. An increasing amount of devices actually use the ARM architecture. So ARM licensed the technology to chip manufacturers such as Samsung who produce the chips and then they are used in a wide range of devices so we're now seeing it in Android, Chrome OS, Fedora, Ubuntu and many more. It's used within uh, Apple iOS such as in the iPhone and the iPad and it's likely that the next release of Windows, Windows 8, will support the ARM architecture. So if we look at the, the range of devices that we typically will uh, compile to at the bottom end we see the mobile processors such as the ARM ones. So a typical one is the ARM Cortex A6, A8. It's about 600 megahertz CPU, has one core and we'll see the how cache memory except it, uh, is used in future slides. But it's a fairly small amount of uh, uh, level 1 cache. Very low power when you see the up at the higher end we're looking at 165 watts for uh, the the processor the A8 is only around 0.3 watts and it's used within the iPhone 3GS device the architecture that's that's just been rolled out is the ARM A15 Cortex this uses uh, dual or quad cores so we can have two or four processors within inside the mobile device uh, and a larger le level 2 cache and it's going to be used and is used extensively in Android type devices and future mobile phones. As we move up we go through the Atom so the Atom of fairly uh, low power here 13 watts and fairly good speeds with one or two cores then up through the i3 as we can see, we can, we're increasing the speed, increasing the number of cores, increasing the, the layer level 1, level 2 cache. And we increase the power rating. Obviously, for a desktop, this isn't too important, but for a mobile device, it's highly important. Then up through the i5, and we start to see a throughput of 2.5 tera transactions per second. And the, the, the clock speed is increasing too with uh, dual core then up to the i7 and with the i7 we see massive throughputs of 6.4 giga transactions that's 6.4 billion transactions per second and we have 
between four and six cores with a fairly fast speed. And then the device that's typically used in server type technologies, the Intel Xeon, where we can have between one and eight cores, lots of uh, cache memory and a very high throughput. So this shows us the range and basically if we segment it here and about here, then we see mobile devices here, we see notebooks and desktop type technology here, especially towards this, notebooks more towards this end, and up the top we see server type infrastructures for the Intel Xeon. What we're likely to see is we're likely to see an increase in this market as this pushes this uh, much more and the so that the power of the desktop is slightly inc to increase but we'll see many more devices in this range taking over a larger share of the market. So the simplest architecture that we can have is that we have a, a microprocessor, it has an address bus to be able to address the memory. Each memory location has 8 bits or 1 byte. Each byte has a specific memory location. We point to the memory location and we read a certain number of bits onto the data bus or we write to memory. So the processor itself is defined either as a 32-bit processor if it has 32 data bits or 64 if it has 64. Obviously, the more data bits that it has, the faster it can actually read and write from memory if it has a lot of memory to read if the program is set up for 64 bits. So we can either have one core, such as in the Pentium. We can have two cores with inside the processor. So we have two processors really with inside the, the single unit. We can have a quad core, such as in the i5, where we have two, four processors. So we can run programs really in parallel. If they allow us to run in parallel, we could be running one com program here, another one over here, some bits of code on this one, and another system program running on this one. So obviously the more cores we have, it's likely the faster the machine will work. You can have a hexa core with six hexa core with six cores on it and then we can have an octa core such as the Xeon with eight uh, CPUs. So if we look at a very simple architecture of our of a computer the processor over here with its address bus and its data bus. In this case it has 64 bits and some controls such as read and write lines. Then we have our basic memory hub, very fast chip here which will allow the fast flow of information in and out of the chip. And over here we have our north bridge and down here we have a south bridge. So graphics are very fa need very fast transfers of information. Our memory here also needs very fast. And down here in the south bridge, this is actually quite slow. So it's really up to this memory hub to really try and optimize the speed between the processor and the memory, processor and the north bridge. And they should take priority over the other, the other uh, bridge. So when we're communicating with graphics, then the data will go out onto the to the graphics bug bus through the memory hub, or if it goes to memory, then it goes right through there into into the RAM and so on. Every time we go out onto this, then we slow the the system down. So if we think this is about three gigahertz here speed clock speed within the processor. We then go out onto the front end bus, which might only be about 600 megahertz. So automatically, whenever we come out from here, then we're going to slow down on to there. So as much as possible, we want to keep things with inside the processor. If we go out here, then we slow things down completely because we've got the mouse and the keyboard, uh, PCI bus, USB, and, and so on. Okay, so this is, tends to be a very slow uh, interface. 
because the speeds are so high here, then we really need to make sure that uh, our all our components are actually kept cool and have heat sinks. So the an important concept with inside the, the device is a, is a cache. And cache is an area of memory which holds any data or code that is likely to be used uh, within a, a short time. So when a processor is accessing memory, okay, so it's been accessed in the memory, it is possible to predict roughly what area memory is likely to be wanted next. So if the processor has been sequentially looking through the memory one by one and reading it, then it's possible to load then a whole chunk of memory into the cache so that rather than going out and accessing it directly, it can get access from the, the cache and, and, and keep very fast throughputs. The static memory is very fast memory as compared to this dynamic memory which is fairly slow but large. So the first, the, the level one, uh, the first level cache is here, very small amount of memory. The processor, the, the on-chip cache controller does a quick check as to what it thinks is likely to be hit next. By the time the processor tries to access it, then the cache controller says, uh uh, I've got it in there, you can have it from there, and then it can actually access it. So the more cache that we have here, obviously the better chance that we have of getting that guess correct. We can also have a second level cache that's off the chip typically, uh, and we have a controller board for that. This tends to be a larger uh, area of, of cache, so we could be looking at 60 megabytes of memory, cache memory here, fairly large, as opposed to something like 64 gigabytes for a server here quite a large area of memory and this might only be about 256k so as we can see there are, our areas of memory are typically seen on the chip so that looks like a large area of memory on on the device and that's likely to be the first level cache memory if we look at the the i7 core so we can see here there's the there's the four cores there's four cores on it there this is likely to be an area of of the cache memory local to the to the core we can have a level two cache and we can see here that it even has a lead a level three shared cache area between all the processors and it's quite a large area of cache. Over here we've got sort of memory control that we see, these type of elements. And then we've even got a, a graphics processor actually on the, the chip. Unfortunately, if we get a miss, then the processor itself would have to go straight out to the dynamic memory. But as it's loading through, then it recalculates and, and refills up the cache, so hopefully it doesn't get it wrong the next time. So if we look at a typical motherboard, we can see here's the processor. This is likely to be the north bridge because we can see that this is a it's got a heat sink and allow it to be likely to be very fast throughputs. We have our main DRAM memory here. This is our IDE, our floppy disk controller. We have power socket here. Uh, this is the PCIe and our PCI uh, adapters and and so on. So in this part we'll look at some code types because they're not all the same as in the the, there tends to be some kind of, there could be some uh, interface between the actual running of the code and the hardware itself. Either it could run directly on the hardware or there is some intermediate agent which is converting from native code into the actual machine code of the architecture that's running. 
So the first basic type that we have, and this is the most traditional form, is that we have our program which is compiled into our machine code, or our OBJ file, specifically for the architecture that we're looking at. That then produces the EXE, which runs directly on the hardware. The advantage of this is that it's fairly fast because it's optimized for the hardware and it can be difficult to actually reverse engineer the executable back into the code again. The problems with it though is that it's very hardware specific so we typically can't run it on other types of architecture. It's unmanaged code where the code runs directly on the hardware and can obviously do damage to the hardware or to other other pieces of code running on the system. It's also difficult to debug as the link between the code and the actual machine code is often, lo uh, is often lost unless we leave on debug with inside the compilation the link between the code, the machine code and the high level code is often broken. A major advance happened when uh, the code was seen to be uh, run with inside a managed environment such as for .NET uh, with C-sharp or VB.NET. With this we compile to an intermediate code which is an abstraction of how the program should run on any type of machine. That is then read by the .NET runtime. It's fairly efficient so it doesn't really have to be interpreted. It's run in real time and then is then converted into the code that's required to run on the hardware. So this shows an example of the Microsoft Intermediate Language or MSIL. So our, our C-sharp code is converted into this format which is then run in the in the .NET runtime environment which runs on the hardware. So it's managed code, so any bad code can be managed. Code is also isolated from other uh, parts of the system. We can make it compatible with any type of hardware. So we, all we need is to get the runtime on the device. So it could run on a mobile device or different types of architecture. It's language independent. Uh, it doesn't matter what language we use here. We can always produce this in some sort of format, so we can use Fortran, Delphi, Java, and so on. It's fairly easy to debug, as the code almost goes back into the original code in a simple operation. But it's fairly slow because it's got to run through this runtime environment, and also different versions only support certain features. But, and a disadvantage also is that it's actually fairly easy to reverse engineer it. Along with this we can have Java which compiles into a similar format which is the bytecode. The bytecode again is, a, is an abstraction of the computer code that will then be converted into the real code on the actual device. So we can see here that the code itself uh, is in a format that can easily be converted back into the, the Java code. So it's managed again, which is quite good. It's compatible with a large range of hardware. Again, it's language independent to some extent. It's isolated. It's fairly good to debug as we can get our code back. But again, with .NET, it's fairly slow. Versions, Java suffers greatly from having different versions of the runtime environment, which aren't matched to the actual Java code, which is running. And as we'll see, it's very easy to reverse engineer the code back. Another type of system that we have, and one that's increasing, is that what we can do is we can virtualize a whole operating system with all the programs within a virtualized infrastructure. So with this, we have our hardware. We then either fit on top of that full virtualization, such as through VMware Workstation, VMware Fusion, which runs on the Mac, and Parallels. This then allows us to run a whole host of different operating systems on a range of, of hardware. So we can run Juniper Networks 
firewalls, Cisco devices, Mac OS, uh, and so on. The other type that we have is to use a hypervisor, and this has uh, some footprint on the system and will generally slow it down. But a hypervisor is a very lightweight program that runs and basically just enables the system to, to virtualize the operating systems almost directly. So good examples of this are VMware ESXi and Citrix Zen. This is often used within a cloud-based infrastructure. So the advantage with this is that we can run many different types of operating systems, many types of hardware and on many types of hardware. There's a reduced requirement for hardware as that we can just have generalized hardware and we can run multiple uh, operating systems on it. It doesn't matter what the native code actually is, we can still run it on code that it hasn't been built for. We can also define predefined environments. We can sandbox. Often uh, what we can do is we can set up virtual instances uh, which are virtualized. We can then set up a network which connects them, which is completely isolated from the rest of the, the internet so that they can actually communicate together in an isolated form, uh, way. The disadvantages is that it can be slow, especially in this area here. Uh, for VirtualBox, VMware, Workstation and so on. It takes up lots of memory and it could actually breach the original license of the operating system. For example, running a Juniper firewall might actually breach the licensing terms required uh, if it was run within a virtualized environment. And basically it will take the native, uh, the calls from the operating system and convert it into the native operating system call. This is how it works really and that all these devices here use the x86 architecture which has this type of uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, structure. Ring 0 is the most trusted level and that runs the most highly trusted code such as system calls and then as we go up, all our applications run in this in this ring. With full virtualization, uh, we interface into this layer here, into into ring ring one, and the 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 virtual infrastructure translates this into the ring zero. For the power of virtualization, we have VMware, ESXi, Zen, Citrix, KVM, and so on. And they use what's called the hypervisor, which sits between the guest operating system and the ring, ring zero. And so this is what's called bare metal virtualization, where the operating system almost sits on the processor itself, and programs with inside it can't tell that they're being virtualized. And then we have the hardware assisted one, uh, such as with uh, Hyper-V, Intel, VT and AMD V. So before we finish this, let's look at another type of code, and that's the emulator. So with emulator we have a program which will translate a certain type of machine code and a certain type of architecture directly into a certain uh, hardware architecture. So a good example of this is with the games emulator such as the ZX Spectrum emulator that we can get to run within Windows. Uh, we can also get Dynamips which will virtualize a Cisco device. So this is running Dynamips and we can set up. So it will convert the Cisco code into the native code for a PC. We can also get emulators for mobile devices such as iPhones, Windows, mobile and, and so on.
So we're going to focus on Microsoft.net uh, and then on Java to show the problems that occur with inside these types of framework uh, infrastructures. So we'll do a quick recap on what .NET actually is and then we'll have a look at an example of how we can compile it and then reverse engineer it and hopefully we can look at the methods that we can use to, to obfuscate the code. So basically, the as we said, uh, the .NET framework integrates lots of things like web, Complus, which is for highly optimized systems, large scale systems, such as database infrastructures. And we have our normal API type interfaces that we can uh, call within our side of code. That produces our executable program, an EXE, which is intermediate code using typically C Sharp or VB.NET within a Visual Studio environment. Lots of advantages. Uh, we have a common runtime uh, language, which is fairly standard across all the .NET programs. We have a common framework class library, which makes sure that all our objects are the same uh, that have the same type, sp same specification, such as the same properties, methods, and so on. We have a common type language where we have co standard definitions for integers, floats, and and so on. And also we have a common language specification, which allows .NET to be built through most types of languages: C Sharp, VB.NET, G Sharp, Fortran, Delphi, and and so on. And the framework itself uh, is contained on the system in a number of uh, different versions. So this one here is version 1.1, 4.3.2.2 release. And it basically has all the DLLs that are required with inside the framework. So these are carefully managed to make sure that they can actually be modified. So when a program needs access to, say, uh, a file I.O., it will call in the MS Core Lib DLL and get access to the code that it requires for that. So if we have a look, a little look at at this, so we should find that it is actually stored on the system. So you can see here we have version 1.0, 1.1, 2.0, .1, and so on. If we go in, then we should be able to see our core. Uh, libraries and so on. So there's the MS Core Lib for .NET 2. So a program runs in a certain version and it will use the framework that it was bound to. So what happens is that uh, we take an intermediate code and many applications can run and they should all be isolated from each other and uncrashable. Then they run within there. We still have a native code that runs on the system. It's this code that could cause damage to the system and cause the system c to crash. If everything was on the, the .NET framework, then the system wouldn't actually crash. So the framework really converts from this intermediate format into the native code for the operating system. And we've went through various versions from 1.0 up to 1.1. 2.0 was a major breakthrough with ASP.NET, 64-bit support, and Bluetooth. Then we got the three main packages that have been developed further. We have the Presentation Foundation, which is Next Generation Graphics, Communication Foundation, which allows for client-server type contracts to be created, uh, which binds con uh, connections together over a network as if they were local. And then we have Workflow, which allows us to define workers and threads and so on that could work on other machines. From here, we've developed onto uh, .NET 4, which has parallel task support, parallel link, and background garbage collection. And the latest one that's been released is 4.5. Okay, so we've looked at .NET. And let's have a look at the code that produces. So we have our C-sharp program uh, for .NET. 
that is then compiled into an intermediate format. So we can see our intermediate format here looks roughly the same as uh, it stores all the, the variable names and the string names and so on. So we can actually pick up all our class names, names of variables, types, and, and so on, and all the methods that are used. So what we do is we will take an example where we'll take the CS file, we then compile it to an exe, then we'll run it, and then we'll see if we can reverse engineer the code back again because it's important that we protect the code so we'll have to use obfuscation on it. Okay, so let's try it. Okay, so let's delete the exe and we're just left with the CS file. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll compile the C-sharp code. And that should have created an exe for us. Okay, so here is our code. Now what we'll do is that we'll see if we can get the code back again. Okay, so we'll just run the code just to see if it's working. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll run exemplar, which is a uh, allows us to reverse engineer the program. Now we can see here it's reproduced exactly the code back again. Okay, so that's what we did. We used exemplar from our exe and that was able to get the C code, the C sharp code back again. And we can see here the code itself is almost exactly the same. So we can use many packages such as .NET Reflector to be able to examine the actual code itself, the assembly as it's called, uh, and to look at all the, the basic types and the code itself purely from the EXE. Okay, so the uh, it's possible to also do the same with uh, Java. So we can have a package called Jade which can uh, decompile our code so we'll take an example here. Okay, so we have our Java code. Then what we'll do is we'll compile it into our bytecode. Takes a little bit longer than the C sharp compiler. But it should get them. It's a very simple code. Okay, so there is our class file. Just check. Very simple program here. Now we can run JAD or our class file. Uh, we see it's created our JAD file. And we can see here we, we have the code exactly back. So anything that runs with inside a framework is likely to be fairly easy to reverse engineer. Okay, so there we are. There's our Java file. We compile it. We get a class file. We then can run 
the program if we wanted with the uh, Java runtime environment. We then use JAD to be able to read the class file, uh, which creates our JAD file, which gives us back the original code. So now that we can see the weakness of the basic process of uh, .NET and Java, let's look at how we can obfuscate our code to make sure that it, it can't be reversed, or at least this original source code can't be recovered. So this is an example of what's called obfuscation. This is actually a real C program, uh, and, it, and it, it is possible to run this, but it's very difficult to tell what it is. And basically, if you were to run it, what you would get is the 12 days of Christmas. And what they've done is they've eliminated white space, which we like because it makes it easier for us to read. Our eyes are drawn towards uh, white space. We it uses conditional and list expressions instead of the more the the more familiar if then else statements and blocks, and it uses simple encoding for strings that we find it difficult to interpret and it uses multiple functions instead of a single one that we would normally expect. So the methods that are typically used to obfuscate, obfuscate is to take our nice variable names and our nice class names and then to convert them into some other format. In this case they've been uh, integrated, they've been changed into a non-printing format so it's very difficult for a human to be able to understand and trace these these variables. So even though the code could actually be run again, uh, it's very difficult to maintain the code at all. We also get string encryption where the actual strings themselves are encrypted in a form. So you can see here it's very difficult to see what the string name actually is. It is possible to find out the the encryption because the key is actually stored within inside the obfuscated package but at least stops someone from searching through the program to be able to find the actual strings, them, the original strings and then they do some flow obfuscation where they can scramble the code so it's very difficult to trace what it actually does. Okay so let's, let's take an example of uh, obfuscation and we'll go back to our example here Okay, so we have a simple program, our simple program. So as we've seen, we can get that back. So what we'll do is that we'll run a basic obfuscator. So in this case, we're running .obfuscator. So we can see now that it's actually crashed the program. So we, we can't actually see what's what's in it. So the the program itself will try to generally crash any uh, reverse engineering package. Okay, so that this is an example. So we have our original code. This is the intermediate code. We can then see that there's a very simple obfuscation. The names have been changed, in this case from class 1 to A, and from name to V0. So we haven't actually encrypted any of the strings here, uh, or hit any of the, the methods used by the objects. But it shows a very simple example of how we can uh, change the names and the classes. And, as we said, what will typically happen is that the reverse engineer package will crash. One thing that we often do when we're analyzing code is to look at its, its footprint uh, on a host. So it's just looking at CPU utilization, its memory, the files that it opens, and so on. 
So one thing we often do is we often run a debugger to be able to actually step through our program to validate it and to make sure that everything is working properly and to to optimize it. And we often bring up the debugger so we can hook on the the process. We can hook on a process, a running process on the system uh, with inside Visual Studio. So we select attach to process if we have a running piece of code. And then we can actually select from one of the programs that are actually run on the, on the machine. And from that, we can actually debug our code from there. And from here, we can see the registers. We can see the actual intermediate code or the machine code and the actual code running itself. We can also go for a dynamic analysis so in this case we're looking at the performance monitor on the machine but any of these metrics can be gathered through our .NET counters. And then we might look at some file trace to see the types of files that our program is opening and how it touches the registry and the threads that are created. So for example we might use a program such as this to be able to look, in this case, we could look at the the trace of the, the registry. So we just have to filter. So this is for a specific program or process name that's actually run. So this shows all the keys that were opened and wrote to within inside the with inside that program and you can see that even a program just starting up is opening and closing interrogating lots of files from the, the registry so that's within just a few seconds it's accessing the registry many hundreds of times so that's just one minute these are all the accesses to our registry so that's why you can see if the registry is corrupt then it's then the whole machine is often cupped. We can look at the files which are opened from it. So we would typically start a process monitor up when the program has been run and then it will capture all the events. We'll just to disable that one. And this shows the the actual graphics that are being loaded and the content that are loaded with inside uh, the the system. So this goes us the basic footprint, and we can get other tools such as registry compare tools, where we can look at the registry before a program starts and after it, and actually look at the differences in the registries uh, between the two. We can also get programs which will determine the files which have been opened and so on. So how do we really validate that something has been changed? Well, often what we do is that we take hash, a uh, hash signature such as MD5. So in this case, we've taken a few hash signatures of files, and then we can see that none of these files have been changed until we get to this one here. And you can see here that the hash signature of that file has actually been changed, so that there's been some modification on the file. All the other ones are still the same. Okay, so we have a basic file trace and we can have our, our registry audit too. Then when we're debugging our program, we can look at its memory, we look at its dissembled code, we look at the stack and so on. And we can actually step through the program one line at a time and try and understand its operation and hopefully its footprint on the system. This way we can identify bottlenecks or even malicious code. And then a basic footprint is 
also created with our network-based behavioural analysis. So this might look at the ports that are actually opened on the machine. So one example of a tool that gives us that information is netstat minus a. From here we can actually tell which ports uh, are actually open and listening. So we can see we're listening on ports 135, 445, 912 and, and so on. So we can get connections. Uh, it also shows us the established connections here and in, in what addresses it actually listens on. Okay, so we can see from there the ports that our program would typically be next that would start then a program would run and then we'd actually analyze which port it was actually opening in. We can also use things like Wireshark to be able to uh, actually analyze the code the, the network protocol that, that uh, our program can actually use. In this case we identify the SYN flag which is often used at the start of a connection and when the ACK flag doesn't exist. So this is the initiation of initial client server communication and then we might look at the connections that it makes and what IP addresses it contacts and so on. Okay, so we've looked at uh, .NET and C Sharp and how it's used in code analysis. So let's take a little bit of a practical journey now and we'll look at how .NET could be used in the analysis of a host, such as determining the cookies on a system and so on. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll open up our project and the first thing we'll look at is how .NET could be used to, to read a file and, a, and determine its, its content. Let's just run it a little bit slow. But it should get there. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to read in some graphics files and then from there we'll be able to determine what the file format is and hopefully identify the file from its basic contents. Okay, so we'll just modify the click event here. It's just taking a long time to open up. Okay, so this is just some standard code here. What we're going to do is to read the file in. Then we're going to open up the file. So let's just find find that. Let's run a little bit slow. Okay, so let's find our method, open file. Okay, so that's going to open up the file and then what it does is it starts a thread in the background. So the thread is a, is a static method that will, that will run uh, and we use threads because it doesn't block the, the main screen. If we didn't, then if for a big file it would block for many seconds so that the user couldn't actually do anything. If we run a thread, then it will run in the background and we will only feel a slight change in the performance, but the system will still respond. So let's have a look at our thread. To see what that does. Let's find it again. And we just have to try and find it again. So we had it initially. So let's go back and do that again. Okay, so this opens up our click event. And we can obviously go over here and look at the events if we want to. So we call up our open file. 
method. This is here. And then we run a thread called get file. So what get file is going to do is it's actually going to read the file byte by byte and hopefully fill it into a byte array. Okay, so here we are. Gets the byte array. So on the disk are the the file is stored in bytes. So we did one byte at a time into this this byte array. Okay, so this is really just displaying our, our bytes as, as it goes along. Okay, so let's just run that and see what it produces. So this, this method here is taking 16 bytes at a time and then we'll show it across the screen. It just makes it easier for us to, to view on a, on a uh, row and column basis. And the X2 displays it in a hexadecimal format. So it takes a number and then converts it into hex to display. Takes a little minute. Uh, it's obviously running a bit slower because it's it's recording at the same time. Okay, so here's our program. Let's ignore the flash screen. Yuck. And it should just start up in a minute. Just shut down a few things. Okay, so here we are. So we'll just click on the binary reader tab. We'll bring in a GIF file. One pre-prepared for us. So then it's, it reads in one byte at a time. And then it will display it in hexadecimal format and also in a character format here. 
So, okay, so this is what our file actually looks like on the disk. And the key thing to notice is that the GIF file, the GIF file starts with GIF 89 AD. And if we see this sequence on the disk, it's likely that what we have is a GIF, is a GIF file. Okay, so this is one way that we can actually identify our content. If we have a look at a JPEG, we should find a similar type of thing. Then we look at the header. The strange thing here is that we've actually managed to uh, hide a message with inside the content. Okay, so a JPEG is seen with the this hex, hex values at the start, and also with the GFIFF to identify the header of the, the JPEG. Zips are identified similarly with a PK and this is a standard start for a, a file. So what we can actually do is that we can create a piece of code that will actually identify what the file type actually is based on the actual file here. So quite a, an unusual thing is that actually a doc file we change the name of our of a doc file b dot zip we actually find that our doc file is actually a, a zip file so we can actually open up our zip file And we should be able to see that it's a perfectly valid zip. There you go. So let's open it up. In WinRAR, we can see our, our, our documents, all our images and so on, uh, with inside the zip file. And we'll just check to see that it's got the same header. So this was our doc file. a little minute to load it up and there we go again so we can see here there's the pk pk there and that's what our doc file actually looks like it's basically just a, a zip file just identify it and we can see it's a, it's a zip okay so let's look at the actual code Okay, so let's look at the code that identifies the file type. Again, we just lose the click event. And what we're doing is we're taking the buffer and we're actually counting. So in this position, if it starts with uh, a letter 50 or a P and, and a 4B, the key, then it's a zip file. JPEG starts with FDD at the start, and, and and so on. So there's there's many different types of uh, formats. He, here are some of the signatures that we might see. Uh, so for PDF, uh, we see the percent PDF. So just let me see if I can find a PDF. There you go. So at the start of a PDF file, we see the percent of PDF, and so on. So there's a there's a number of different file formats. 
If we have an MP3 file, it starts with an ID3, hopefully. should see ID3 at the start of it. Okay, so we should be able to dive into a file and actually find its, its content. For this, this next part, what we'll do is we'll look at uh, some of the special things with inside.net that allows us to look with inside the system such as with inside the cookie folder and, and so on. So in the first example we'll look at how we can actually see all the URLs that have been accessed. So we'll just have a quick look at the code that relates to that. So we can define a start and end date for it. Okay, so we use a show history method here. And we have an item called get history items. Okay, so this this is our, our URL. That uh, this is our our class that allows us to get the history. We can then enumerate it and get a list from it, which we then fill up. Okay, so we've used this uh, this class here to create the URL object history. Okay, so let's click there, and this basically shows us the the URL history. We can actually define the date of the accesses. We can filter, and 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 so on. So for the next part, uh, we'll just actually run this this code so that we can actually see the operation. So the, the system itself uh, keeps a track of recent documents, cookies. Should get there eventually.
a look at the application data, desktop, favorites, some history, internet cache. There's the documents, my music, pictures, programs, previous files, and the startups, and some system files. Okay, so this is a useful thing for actually finding some contents on the, on the machine. Another useful feature with inside Windows is WMI. WMI is, a, is an excellent technique to be able to determine some basic details about a system. So we can run we can run the the command from the prompt if we want. Gives, gives us a good deal of forensics information about the system, such so as serial code, product name, and so on. So I can find out so much about the system, such as its BIOS, the boots, the disks, and we can get full information too through through WMI. We can look at the drives on the system. and so on. Look at our volumes. Okay, so it shows you the file system, their label, how much free space they have, the capacity, the disk types and their actual name. Okay, so in the tutorial you should be able to add the extra little bits of code that allow you to, to access them.